Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hello, everybody. My name is Debbie. I'm your host today from NDIS Property Australia, and you're listening to the SDA Housing Podcast, a show that explains, highlights, guides, and brings awareness about all things SDA in this ever-changing NDIS world. Today, I am going to be talking about just a general overview of challenges and concerns that investors have. Obviously, we have been speaking to a lot of different people looking to invest in SDA throughout Australia over the last few years. And and in this process, I guess we've learned quite a lot in terms of the questions that are being asked, the challenges that investors are facing in trying to understand SDA and understand how the whole process works. So I actually presented this information at some conferences during the 2023 year around Australia and thought that this might just be some interesting content for people out there to get more of an understanding of what we do, but also just things to look out for and understand if you are looking at investing in the space. So what we've learned investors actually want is transparency. They want reassurance and they want to understand what the risks and the costs actually are. They want diversity, so a range of different locations, types of products, so house and lands, apartments, development sites. Um, We also have quite a big demand for built SDA and we're starting to get the occasional built property that is either tenanted or not tenanted but is completed. Coming through not a lot um, but they are coming through in dribs and drabs so I believe that is something that is going to increase in the future as this industry matures. Investors want knowledge. Now we carry out our own internal research, do a lot of training and we're very much of the attitude that we want to pass on that knowledge and pass on all the information and sources of information to investors. You need to really understand what you're getting into in this process. Investors want confidence. For example, we're not into the hard sell. We're not providers. We just advise on SDA and we're focused in other areas of NDI's property, as some of you may well know. You know, we're working in the short-term accommodation and respite. We do a lot of community engagement and events and conferences around Australia. So it's all about, as I said in the previous point, knowledge and, and spreading that knowledge around. So the challenges that we have come across that invent- investors really face is lack of transparency from vendors selling these properties. A lot of them promising high returns and guaranteed incomes that don't eventuate. They charge upfront fees. And if you're going to someone that is going to be charging you an upfront fee before you can find out any information, then I'd be a little bit wary about where they're actually coming from. Challenges that investors face are understanding the risks and understanding the true costs that these properties actually come to. So, you know, we know that you'll be presented with a package and that's the turnkey price, but there are, of course, like if you buy a regular house and land package, there's going to be other costs over and above that price. Legal costs, stamp duty, rates, and of course, when it comes to SDA properties, you have additional costs specific, and those are things like your provider engagement fees and your participant placement fees. So you need to sort of assume that you'll be spending an extra thirty to fifty thousand dollars over and above that turnkey package price to actually get the keys to the property. The risks, 
Tenancy issues are probably the main risk. No tenants, you don't get any income. And provider issues. Now, providers really are the key to everything here. And if you you don't engage a provider early enough, a good provider who's going to be able to find you the right tenants that are going to give you a good income, then not necessarily going to have a very successful investment. Uncertainty of tenancy and income. So as I said, no tenants, no income. I mean by that, that the funding follows the tenant and that funding that the tenant has is what they bring to the property. So you may assume you're going to get a a high physical support, the highest funded tenant in that property, but that's not necessarily going to be the case. Uh, You might have a couple of tenants move in who've got the lower level of funding, improved livability, or somebody with improved livability and somebody with FA funding. And that mix is going to affect your ultimate income. So it's really important to understand what those different rates are and incomes are and and what the potential true income is that you might get. And you're not going to actually know what it is until such time as you have participants applying to live in your home. Other challenges are lack of resources to learn and understand SDA. So look, this is a new scheme, the SDA scheme around Australia. It's only really been going five, six years. And there's not many places really to learn much about it. There's a few, obviously the NDIA themselves, the NDIS website has a lot of information. Housing Hub and the Summer Foundation have some fantastic resources. I think when we started a few years ago, three and a half years ago, that was where we got so much of our knowledge and information from. DSC and uh, other organisations like NDISDA that hold conferences, there's some really good sources of information out there. And of course, the SDA housing podcast that you're listening to here. We do try to put out as much information as possible on all different aspects of SDA. So there are places out there to get that information, but we do still have a long way to have a large database of resources for investors. Moving on from that, resources, including supply and demand. Now, we do a lot of research into that data. We actually provide an update every quarter to our supply and demand data ebook, which covers basically the supply and demand across Australia broken down into all the SA4 regions across the country. And, And it's straight off the NDIA quarterly data And we update that as it comes out to provide information, but it is quite general and and broad range. So for people that want to have more information about specific areas and the supply and demand in those more specific regions, the suburbs and local government areas, then we actually do reports, paid reports that you can get that information. If there's a specific area you're looking to invest in, well worth paying a couple of hundred dollars if you're looking at investing eight, nine hundred thousand dollars at the end of the day. A lack of lenders is another challenge investors face. And there's maybe five or six non-bank lenders that we know of The big banks don't really do this. I believe that Westpac is starting to do NDIS loans, but at a very high LVR. So you're much better off going to one of the experienced non-bank lenders that specialize in NDIS finance. And of course, finance approval is another challenge. But if you you do go through the right organizations and mortgage brokers and lenders that understand all of that, then you should be able to get through it without too much problem. So back on the finance, we actually also, I just mentioned our data reports, we also do provide financial reports, paid reports if people are interested in getting a feasibility on a particular property. These reports actually provide a full breakdown of your holding costs during the construction of a property, additional costs that you might be looking at, such as a, a furniture package, the insurances, the rates, stamp duty, solicitor's fees, all those sorts of things, as well as the provider onboarding and placement fees. And and we also break that down into a, a monthly and an annual income and what you can expect to actually get depending on the tenancy. So we also give you an overview of a bunch of different scenarios where you might have best case scenario being two 
high physical support tenants with the highest funding, which will obviously give you the highest return and the biggest yields, but you are probably less likely to have that situation in your property. You're more likely to get a mix of lower funded tenants. So we will show a whole lot of different scenarios of those mixes and what that income is potentially going to look like to give you much broader range of, of options that at the end of the day is is really what you need to know. We can also do a PIA report on the specific property to give you an even more in-depth look at the financial outcome on one of these property investments. So in c- other concerns, um, so I've looked at so I've spoken about the challenges for investors, but we've also found that they have a lot of other concerns when it comes to looking at an investment in SDA, and that is that the upfront costs are higher than a regular investment property. There may be limited capital growth and valuation concerns. Of course, these properties do cost more. They're very high spec and they have a lot of inclusions that may not be that obvious to the eye if you were to look inside one of these properties, but in the in the back end of the actual construction, there's a lot that goes into it that does cost up, um, often $200,000 more than a regular investment property. Uh, limited capital growth, well, that all comes down to where you're going to be buying. If you're looking at, at spending a bit more in the big cities, in the areas closer into the CBDs rather than way out in the new estates and greenfield areas, then your capital growth is, is probably going to be quite good. And valuation concerns, what we have been hearing from the the lenders and, and valuers in recent times is these properties really are coming in on par because the the valuers understand the the property. They understand the SDA scheme as a whole and what the potential incomes are and therefore what the property really is worth. Uh, they they know that it's not a regular resident residential property and they do value it as an ongoing commercial investment. Uh, concerns also include potential changes to the NDIS. Now, we know income is dependent upon the tenant's funding. Is that funding going to continue? Will it increase? How secure is the government funding? Will a change of government affect policy, affect the SDA as a whole? What happens in five years when the next pricing review is done, the one that just came out Mid- midway through this year, we saw that the prices for high physical support units actually dropped, which was a bit of a surprise to everybody. But I think what happened this year was really just a an evening out of prices that only initially introduced the prices five years ago. So they didn't really know what that effect would have with certain pricing levels, encouraging investment in dwelling types of weren't going to be tenanted because there was just too many of the wrong types. So I think this has been a correction more than anything and probably a little less likely to see any major changes or so major next time around. In terms of the overall SDA scheme, it's a very small part of the bigger NDIS budget and the government and the NDIA can appreciate the cost savings that SDA actually provides to the overall NDIS in terms of the savings of care provision. Once a a participant moves into a home, they are saving money in other areas. And if a participant is living in a hospital bed or a nursing home, that's also a much higher cost than the eventual funding will be for them to live on their own in an SDA home or in a share home. So we don't really see that SDA is going to change a lot. And of course, it is pegged to CPI. So every year, those SDA incomes will go up. Other concerns are vacancy risk. Yeah, this is a very valid concern. And we know that on average around Australia, it probably takes six to nine months to fill vacancies. But generally, as long as you've got a future-proofed home, you've built it way above minimum standards, once you have your tenants in place, they're there for life. And yes, there may be a, a turnover during that 20-year period. Uh, we know a lot of these participants do have a shorter lifespan, but there is funding in place from the NDIS if you do have a tenant leave for whatever reason. Uh, so you get it to 60 days of the funding you were receiving if you have a tenant leave a house. 
Other reasons for vacancy might be things like participant compatibility, logistical issues with the SIL providers, the carers, and NDIA funding decision delays, meaning that you might have a participant lined up, but they're still waiting on their funding being approved. And and we know that in some cases that can take a very long time, especially if they have to appeal their decision because they didn't get the right one in the first place. Um, other issues investors have is how do I know my property is going to be SDA compliant? Do I need to be a provider to look after this property? Well, compliance is basically drawn into the plans and before a property can be constructed, the plans have to be assessed as compliant to the SDA guidelines. So the builder is responsible for handing over a compliant SDA property. So that should not be an issue. What you want to make sure is that it goes well above those minimum standards. You don't need to be an SDA provider. You, It's very much a hands-off investment, but of course you do need to engage a good SDA provider to manage the property for you. Other concerns include a limited market and limited resale options of the property. Uh, yeah, this is a, a limited market, the SDA market. It's a very small, small cohort. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at around about 24,000 participants Australia-wide that have SDA funding or potentially have SDA funding. And the NDIA have stated that in total, they expect up to 36,000 will require SDA by 2042. Uh, so as more dwellings come on the market, for sure, there will be maturing of the industry and a limited market. So it's definitely a good time to get in now and, and build a very high quality property and get your tenants in place. The The longer you wait, the, the more that the places, the demands, the locations are going to be supplied in areas that are affordable. And, and really, we're only going to be probably looking at needing a lot of properties built in areas where the gap still exists because it hasn't been feasible. Places like Sydney, inner cities of Brisbane, of Melbourne, of Perth, in the rural areas where there is, we've got a far more limited market, still a demand, but just the logistics of construction and building in those areas can make it a lot harder. Limited resale options, given that the properties are purpose-built, well, a lot of these properties. So the high physical support ones, sure, they do look a little bit more purpose-built. They're much bigger rooms, hallways, doorways. The bathrooms are very spacious and, and set up with disabled toilets and, and showers. So that might not be as appealing to resell it onto the open market, but some of the other property types, certainly the improved livability and robust, they look very similar to a normal property you basically wouldn't know. So on the open market, you should not have a problem reselling it. Of course, it's cost you more to build it in the first place. So ideally, you're going to want to resell it within the SDA market as an SDA property. And we know that there is such a high demand for people wanting to buy a built property and they will pay a premium for that. So that shouldn't be and a big concern for investors. Other things that the investor should know, okay, participant rights. As per the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, people with disability are not obliged to live in a particular living arrangement and must be provided with the opportunity to choose where and with whom they live. So that comes down to the NDIS, choice and control. And it's really important to remember that the participant has the choice of whether they want to live in your home or someone else's home. And hence, build your home better than the other homes in the same street or suburb or location. And the participants will choose your home because they have that choice. Group homes. Back in the early days of SDA, back in 2015, 2016, 2017, we saw a lot of group homes being constructed because they felt, well, the more participants in these homes, the the uh, more income and more for whatever reasons. But in the last price review that came out in June, the NDIA review panel actually recommended group homes be phased out. It's considered 
in the industry, group homes are considered sort of a waypoint between institutions and independent living. And going back to the previous point that participants have choice and control, a lot of them don't want to live in big group homes with a number of other tenants. They they want to live on their own or they might be happy only sharing with one other. So really important that we're building to what the demand is, and that is the demand. Robust homes. Of the full pie of SDA participants, we know robust participants make up around about 10% of all those SDA-funded participants. But the complication with robust participants is that around 80% of them can't share. They need single tenancy and they need much more bespoke builds because they um, very generally have specific requirements and those homes need to be designed to keep them safe for whatever the requirements that they have, their physical or their mental condition is. So it is more difficult to develop robust and ideally you want to be developing single tenancy. There is no single tenant house robust funding. You only get single tenant villa, townhouse, duplex funding. And often it's just not as financially feasible with the incomes, the SDA funding that robust participants receive. So we see a significant need for robust single tenancy, robust homes in many parts of Australia. Uh, And if you are willing to develop those and take a lower yield, still well above regular residential, but a lower yield compared to some of the other SDA types, there is definitely a huge demand for robust. Other things you need to know as an investor, tenants, Tenancy matching and tenancy mix. It's a very complex and intensive process to match participants to the right property, to the right co tenant, and to the right support. So you might think, build my home, okay, let's find two tenants to move in. Can't be that hard. Well, it actually is quite difficult. And um, we just recently had a podcast with Karina and Nicole from. SDA Consulting Group and have a good listen to that if you want to find out more about the challenges in actually tenanting properties from an SDA provider's perspective. Tenancy mix, I did touch on this earlier, but it's really important to know that participants have a particular level of funding. They might be funded to live in a two-tenant home or they might be funded to live in a three-tenant home. And that funding level is going to be significantly different. For example, Somebody with improved livability funding to live in a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom home but with one other tenant and an OOA being the overnight on-site support, their funding is around about 70000 If someone has funding to live in a four-bedroom home with two other tenants and the OOA, again, improved livability, their funding is only $50,000 a year. So we're looking at a $20,000 difference there. Now, when it comes to your property, you might have a three-bedroom home that has been designed for two tenants and an OOA. And you might think, okay, so automatically my minimum is going to be 70000 per participant because that's what the home is built to. But if you have a participant that applies to live in your home and they've got three-bedroom funding, you'll only get the lesser of. So you'll only get that 50000 funding that they have in their plan. Likewise, if you have a three-tenant home, if you've built a four-bedroom, three-tenant plus OOA home, and you get someone apply who's got two-tenant funding, and you think, great, I'll get 70000 because that's what they've got in their funding. No, it's the lesser of you'll still only get what the house has been enrolled as, which is a three-tenant home. So there's a lot of complications that go into the income And it's really important to get your head around how these things work. So basically, uh, that covers really what we have learned. SDA investors need to understand and learn before looking into an SDA investment. So, you know, we have a lot of information on our website. We publish some different e-books on the different design types. As I mentioned, our supply and demand data report comes out every quarter and we are always happy to talk to anyone and just give more information about these 
concerns and challenges and, and really try to educate you on, on what you need to know before looking into this investment. And of course, there's a lot of episodes on this podcast going back a couple of years nearly now with a wealth of information. So we'd recommend you to take some time and learn all about it and talk to us anytime that you want. If you have questions that you can't find an answer to, we're very happy to help. So that wraps up my session today on what you need to understand as an SDA investor. And I hope that you found that of interest. And if you have any questions, then send us an email to info at ndis.property or you can call us on 1300 254 397. Okay, thanks and bye for now. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.